by the late 1800s, we were, we being scientists, I guess, I don't know if anyone else paid attention. We were generally convinced that atoms were a thing. That matter was made of a combination of fundamental elements and that the fundamental elements were composed of individual bits called atoms. And then you combine the atoms together to form more complex molecules and more complex things. The picture wasn't 100% settled by then. And there were definitely some very, very strong opponents to that idea that had some very, very convincing arguments at the time. But it was, it was, it was like leaning in that direction that, you know, atoms are going to be a thing. And the smallest known atom of the time was associated with the lightest element known, which was hydrogen. So we thought at the time that hydrogen was by far the lightest element. And so it's atom, one atom of hydrogen would be the smallest thing you could see in the universe. That That's it. There's nothing smaller than a hydrogen atom. And totally independent of that line of thinking of, you know, the history of the atom and chemistry and all that great stuff, uh, learning about hydrogen, there were these sets of experiments studying, of all things, electromagnetism. All throughout the, in the 1900s, you, you see this wonderful development of understanding electricity and then magnetism and the relationship and then Maxwell's laws and all that good stuff. And through the various combinations of experiments that scientists had devised to, to study electromagnetism, they had developed something called a, a, a cathode ray tube, where you take a, a tube of glass and suck out all the air, and then you put two electrodes in there, a cathode and an anode, and you hook it up to a battery so that you, you can get a current going in there. You know, pretty, pretty basic setup nowadays, but back then it was pretty advanced technology. And you turn up the juice and you see what happens. And what people would see what happened is there'd be an arc, like a glow between the cathode and the anode. And so they called this glow a cathode ray because it looked like a ray of light coming from from one of the electrodes. And then if you suck down all the air, this glow, this beam, this ray would reach all the way to the end of the tube and actually make the end of the tube glow. And like, wow, that's pretty neat. What the heck is it? Well, it has, we figured it has something to do with electric charge because you're hooking it up to a battery in your or you know a power source and you're cranking up the juice so maybe there's charges like zipping by and at this time we had no idea what electricity was made of we didn't know if it was a fluid or made of one of the elements or something we didn't know but then there was also the light the glow from the ray itself and a physicist by the name of J.J. Thompson, together with his student, uh, Ernest Rutherford, really took uh, an interest in these cathode rays. And they wanted to know, is, is the glow the same thing as the charges, or are they separate? Like, can we split off, when we look at this beam, can we make the charges, whatever the charges are, separate, deviate from the beam of light? And if we can, maybe we can learn about light, we can learn about charges, you know, we could, this is, you know, honest to goodness physics. So they developed the best possible cathode ray tube that they could. They had a really, really great vacuum pump. They sucked out tons of air. And in order to play with charges, you need electricity and magnetism. So they would set up around or inside their cathode ray apparatus, uh, be able to generate a strong electric field or a strong magnetic field, and they would see what happens. And they found that no matter what, they couldn't get the charges to separate from the glow. So right there, that tells you something. Whatever's making the glow is the charges, whatever the charges are made of. And they were able to find that if you put a strong electric field in, you know, the, the charges move. And if you put in a strong magnetic field in, this cathode ray will, will bend. Ah, this is useful information too, because this is telling you, excuse me, this is telling you that cathode rays, whatever they are, 
are made of charged things. Like it's the same thing that's making electricity happen. And this is where Johnson, J.J. Johnson, uh, got got the big idea that eventually won him a Nobel Prize was that if he could put in both an electric and a magnetic field. So if he had an electric field pointing up and the magnetic field pointing down, he would adjust these, the various strengths of these until, you know, the, the path stopped bending. You know, the electric field would make the path go one way, the magnetic field would make the path go to the other, and then he'd tweak them so that they were in balance. And then he could do some ratios. He could do some ratios because charges respond to an electric field in one way, depending on their mass and charge, and they respond to a magnetic field in a different way, depending on their mass and charge. And since you know how strong the electric field is that you're putting in and how strong the magnetic field is that you're putting in, that's part of your experiment, you can take those ratios and you can figure out the charge to mass ratio on these cathode rays. And what he found, what he found was that whatever the cathode ray is, cathode ray is made of, it is about 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. It's subatomic. There is a particle. Whatever makes cathode rays is a particle that is 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. Big deal, right? Big deal. This was the first, our first taste of the subatomic world. The next taste came from his own student, Ernest Rutherford, who was trying to figure out the relationship between these cathode rays, which had recently been renamed as electrons, how these electrons work inside of an atom. Because we know electrons exist and we know that atoms by now are things, but, and, and so there must be electrons inside of an atom, but how? So he devised, he devised an experiment where he took gold foil and he chose gold because he could make really, really, really thin sheets, super thin sheets. And he took, uh, helium particles and was able to accelerate helium particles into the gold foil. Just spit them out and then see what happens. And he set up a photographic screen on the back so they would come through the gold foil and then go out the back and then hit the photographic screen. And so he knew that these helium ions were coming in a straight line and he knew that there were these teensy tiny charged particles floating around inside of the gold atoms. And so they would interact with each other. And he thought that maybe he would just see some like gentle deflections, you know, some very, very smooth motions. That was the current best model of the atom at the time. But instead what he saw was absolutely surprising. And he said, you know, this surprised me. But he was set up to be surprised, right? Because he had a really, really good experiment that was testing a hypothesis. And instead of like slight deflections or little curves every once in a while, what he saw was that almost every single helium ion just blasted straight through. Every once in a while there would be deflections. You know, there'd be a little curve. And then every, every, every once in a while, like one in 20,000, a helium ion would just go, And then a bunch more would go through. And then one would go, boom. What the heck is that? What is that telling you? If most of the helium ions go through totally unfazed, some get their paths curved, and some bounce back the way they came, what does that tell you? It tells you that an atom, whatever this atom is, Most of its mass is concentrated in an incredibly tiny volume because this is the only way to explain the data. The helium ions miss the nucleus of these atoms most of the time because the the nucleus has to be very, very tiny for these helium ions to just blast on through. And then every once in a while, boom, you get unlucky and you get bounced back. So most of the mass has to be concentrated in an incredibly tiny volume. And the electrons 
have to be in a cloud or orbits around that nucleus. It was the only way to explain this result. That, that was not just an introduction. It was, it, it, it was J.J. Thompson's work with the cathode rays was our introduction into the subatomic world. Rutherford's experiment with the gold foil and the helium ions and all that was our first, at the time, incomplete, but our first picture of an atom, the inside of an atom. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter so I can keep doing this. I really appreciate it and I'll see you next time.